Now, communism to me is not a particularly interesting word to interpret the Chinese society. Just because it is so outdated, China today is in no way in resemblance to a communist system. And you just wouldn't expect any serious and well-informed scholars and China watchers to use this word. Every time I read this, I could feel my heart broken into tiny little pieces. I think it captured so beautifully the limits of a foreign journalist to connect and relate to the Chinese people. I know this might come as a surprise, but it can be really boring to just be Chinese all the time, especially when you speak a foreign language. I don't want to be thinking the same thing. I am always in a mood to spice things up. So a while ago, I thought it would be really fun and interesting to explore other books and literature on China uh, that I know for certain that Beijing would absolutely not want to publish in the country, you know, because of the political sensitivities. I felt like if I don't get a good bite of them, I'm missing out on a great opportunity to learn new things and just be open-minded. So in this video, I will be reviewing and rating some of these books on topics like Xi and Mao and CCP, the communism, 1989, China's US relations, one child policy and all that kind of juicy stuff. Hello friends, if you're new here, my name is Siming and on this channel I talk about China and I also explore different ways to interpret China. Okay, so if you haven't read those books, don't worry about it. It's gonna just be me talking about my personal stories and comments and my general approach to these topics just with the backdrop of a book. So before I get into them, I want to quickly talk about how I would normally review these books to talk about my um, taste for content, if you will. <laughs> Obviously, they need to be well written and rigorous and show good knowledge of Chinese politics. But for me, the most important thing that bolt of lightning that will dictate if I want to give away my heart will be this one thing. I mean, you can mess up your writing, but if you have this, I am good. I would love the author to show me a bit of love and respect with the Chinese audience in mind because oftentimes I will read a well-written piece and I will feel so impressed and persuaded by the strength of the argument but still a part of me will still feel very put off and in the end I will still resist it and I think that in hindsight the reason was because there was a patronizing undertone to it it was very very subtle it was usually in how they use language but it is there and I can always tell. You know the time when people give you an offhand compliment? That's how it feels. Um, so it's gonna be a no for me. I have also deliberately chosen authors that are very well trained in the fields who knows what they're talking about. Journalists, academics, policy advisors. So I expect to be impressed, okay? I expect myself to be so impressed. I expect my jaw to drop. <laughs> so I'll be rating them from one to five. Five, excellent, four, very good. Um, three, good, two, okay, and one, being bad. So without further ado, let's get started. So the first book is Party of One, The Rise of Xi Jinping and China's Superpower Future, which is written by a Wall Street journalist, Chen Han Wang. So by the title, you can tell this is a report on the Chinese government. So this is my intuitive reaction. If the author, wants to start a course and teach people everything he knows about Chinese politics. Here's my money, cash or card, I'm all in. <laughs> it touches upon so many important aspects of the Beijing government, on Xi Jinping's life, on how he structured the party, on diplomacy, economy, and how he deals with the subject of education and writing history. On Taiwan, on Xinjiang, on Hong Kong, I was so pleasantly surprised by the death and the scope of this book. The discussion on China often get lost in the oversimplified comparison between democracy and autocracy. What I really love about this book is the fact that the author discussed China with so much nuance and details and he doesn't jump into conclusions straight away. So instead of saying Beijing is authoritarian and nothing it does is good and we should condemn it, he says 
Because Beijing is authoritarian, this is how he thinks and behaves and feels and reacts and that is why they made this and this and this decisions. The difference matters big time. I also really enjoy how he talks about Xinjiang, which I previously tried to address, but not entirely successfully. Although he did perceive Beijing as draconian and high-handed, he also explained where China got the inspiration for correction facilities and why that was so important for the government. The writing is riveting and engaging and rigorous and rich with factual details. Top-notch journalism, no doubt about it. If I have to critique this book, I would say that although this is a very well-investigated Western perspective on China, it doesn't deviate too much from the Western tradition of political analysis. The author is still seeing China through the lens of autocracy, democracy, uh, liberty and control, which is sort of the copy and paste standard of Western literature on China. I think that because of this, he has neglected other important aspects of the Chinese governance. So, for example, pragmatism. I think that under Xi's government, China has also made uh, immense progress on building public transportation, technology, improving the environment. Without understanding these, you can't say you have a full picture. So in terms of approach and philosophy, there's nothing new here. But still, this is probably one of the best books I've read on China this year, five star. Next, we have One Child, The Story of China's Most Radical Experiments by Mei Fong, who was also a Wall Street journalist. So a bit of backstory. I am an only child and I also knew that my mother wanted two children. She actually got pregnant uh, a few months after I was born. So at the time, if you wanted to keep that baby, you have to pay for roughly 40 grand US dollars. So the story was my parents could technically pay the fine, but at the time they were early entrepreneurs and they were very overwhelmed, especially by the bureaucracy. There was an entire process you have to go through to have the second child for it to be legal. And um, they just uh, vetoed against it and never tried to have another baby again. My parents just kind of uh, moved on, I think. I do remember there was one point where my mom joked and said something along the lines of, what did I say? Um, but yeah, yeah, this one. You go pump out as many babies as you want. We all support you through and through. <laughs> oh, I love her. Anyhow, the book is a series of essays about all the social ills and changes happened under the one child policy. She talked about the brutality of the population police, the spoiled brat phenomenon, as well as the dating problems caused by the disproportionate ratio between men and women because many Chinese families prefer to have a boy over a girl. But what really connected me with the author was when she talked about the story of a Chinese couple whose only daughter died from the 2008 Sichuan earthquake when she talked about how she interacted with these mourning parents. I'm gonna read you a paragraph. After seeing Tang and Liu stagger to the hills in search of the daughter's body, I left. In truth, I ran. I ran because I had a deadline. I ran because I thought there was nothing more I could do for them. I ran because I didn't want to be there. I ran and I always felt guilty for the unseemly haste with which I abandoned them on that ruined road. Every time I read this, I could feel my heart broken into tiny little pieces. I think it captured so beautifully the limits of a foreign journalist to connect and relate to the Chinese people. Because for them, witnessing is just a job. You know, they're here to capture a political story. They have the comfortable life. You know, if they don't like China, they could leave. Whereas these Chinese people, they were deep in their misfortune and they were just desperate for things to get better. They're not thinking about politics. They are just trying to get on with life. And I thought that was such a poignant and vulnerable 
contrast. In overall, I will give it a three. It's very good information. Also, if you don't know a lot about Chinese society, this is the one for you. This is the entry book. Next, we have The People's Republic of Amnesia by Louisa Lim on 1989 Tiananmen protest. First things first, I love the wordplay here on the title. I think it's very clever. Fair play to the author. And also, I have a physical copy of this book, which ironically I bought in China back in 2016 from an English bookstore online, I think. I know, right? <laughs> The book featured different people whose lives were invariably intertwined with this event. We have the descent artists who were silenced and jailed because of the political act and um, creating art related to the event. We also have the mother who lost their son. We also have the student who protested and who supported liberal democracy until this day. It's the story about the underdog. It's about reminding people of the danger of forgetting. When I first read it, I was very emotionally disturbed by what I read. I felt like I was finally given the truth um, that wasn't taught to me and it allowed me to explore narratives and to understand why these people make such and such argument. But now returning to this the second time, I think I have developed a much more moderate view on these accounts because one, I realized that they can't replace how I personally relate to the Chinese society and the China they experienced at the time was not the China that I experience. China has evolved and changed a lot over the last three decades. And then the second thing is that as I learn more about politics, I also learn about things that weren't necessarily convenient to include in the narrative of the book. For example, it was also the government who sent out healthcare workers to take care of the students when they went on a hunger strike. I just realized that the book's narrative is political in itself and it didn't come obvious to me the first time I read it. Personally, I do appreciate when people document stories that won't give due attention. So the book read like a time capsule for me. But overall, I'm going to give it a three. I'm not very fond of the writing style, but I think that it makes a interesting memoir of the event. Moving on to next, we have We Have Been Harmonized, Life in China's Surveillance State by a German author, Kai Strittmatter. I actually don't mind a title like that, as long as it is well executed. I was looking forward to maybe a discussion on CCTV, China's vision for unification and how that might have influenced people's sense of ethics and the relationship between the state and the people. So the book does address some of these issues. For example, China's education system doesn't create a lot of independent and creative thinkers. I can say from experience that although the school does teach you a lot of useful information and it does also very much value education on a foreign language. It doesn't encourage a lot of critical thinking and having genuine curiosity about the world. If you can teach people how to be politely curious about the world, and when they went off and travel outside the country and interact with people from other cultures, they can actually create genuine connection, which in turn improve China's relations with the rest of the world. But I don't love the tone of this book, mostly because I think the author just came across as a bit obnoxious, really. He is very cynical about the good things China has done. He constantly argues that the only thing Beijing cares about is to dominate and subjugate its people. He often used very emotional language like shameless and not human and stupid, which I felt was really unprofessional. If you are trying to give people some serious opinions on a controversial subject, he even devoted an entire chapter to social credit system, which I felt was a bit ignorant. I think that the author is probably passionate to a fault. The book would make a lot more sense if he could add another chapter that explains where he got his belief from. 
Maybe he has got family members that had survived the Soviet Union and had a terrible time or had worked for the Nazi. You know, he's German, so I'm just making guesses here. Anything that can give me a bit of context, that can help me to relate. I love a good criticism and I love a German perspective, but I was just a bit underwhelmed by this book. I'm sorry guys, it's gonna be a one. All right, so moving on to next, we have Mouse Grape Famine by Frank Dakota. As you might or might not know, terrible things happened when Chairman Mao was in charge. One of that is a big famine at the end of the 1950s and the early 1960s. That was the time when Mao decided that China would single-handedly surpass the UK in steel production while the Soviet Union was trying to catch up with America. Most people in the countryside were called to make steel and iron. As a result, there weren't enough farmers and healthcare workers and food, and everyone turned into a political fanatic, and the system also discouraged people from telling the truth and reporting problems. Millions of people did not receive enough food and healthcare and ended up losing their lives because the environment was so brutal and harsh. Um, that was basically how my great-grandmother passed away. So the book is a very detailed account of what happened, about how the leadership made the wrong decisions, how the entire system encouraged cruelty and lying, and how people suffered and died. It is very, very heartbreaking to read. Many Chinese people would actually agree that this is morally reprehensible. As ambitious and visionary as Mao was, he was also incredibly narcissist, power-hungry, and cared very much for creating a personal glory in history. In China, we do acknowledge that, but to a much lesser extent. So the investigation into what happened was very much needed and appreciated. Although one thing to be careful of, the author approached the history from the bad male narrative and doesn't necessarily give equal amount of weight to other socioeconomic, environmental and international factors, which I think helped shape China's leadership decisions at the time. To some extent, I think the book can be misleading uh, in that it can create this impression that China is communist and communist China is evil. And I don't think that is a helpful argument to make at this point. So if you are going for a more critical reading, then you want to draw conclusions vertically and not horizontally. What I mean is that every political event is time and context specific. And China at the time was faced with unique international environment and material condition and education and like experience support. And I think that we need to take those in consideration rather than to judge it from our current perspective. So instead of saying, Mao is a complete evil bastard. We want to go for something that is a little bit more refined. A poverty-stricken, inexperienced, isolated China mistakenly emulates communism and ended up with fatal mistakes, which unfortunately was exacerbated by an immature system and personal flaws of Mao. Now, communism to me is not a particularly interesting word to interpret the Chinese society. Just because it is so outdated, China today is in no way in resemblance to a communist system. And you just wouldn't expect any serious and well-informed scholars and China watchers to use this word. Anyhow, I really enjoy reading this book. Uh, I think it is really well researched. I love that it has so many references to China's internal archives, and that makes the book really strong. So it is definitely a four. I think that's only fair. Moving on to the next, we have The Truth About China by an Australian journalist, Bill Bertels. This is about his reporting experience in China on important issues like Hong Kong, the trade war, the pandemic, the stories of dissent and underdog, with a focused lens on repression and censorship. My first impression of this book the storytelling is great, it is addictive and personal and vulnerable. It gives me a lot of insights into how a Western journalist approached work in China, and that was really interesting. Okay, so here's how I personally relate to Bill Bertel's voice. There are different types of foreigners in China, and I don't want to stereotype them too much. I'm just sharing my personal observation. 
I know some, to be one of the most open-minded people in the world, they actually practice Chinese, they hang out with Chinese people 90% of the time, they have a Chinese partner. You can just tell that they incorporate Chinese-ness as a part of who they are. And they're very willing to interact with China and see China through the eyes of the Chinese people. And there will be others, and I don't want to say that they are not open-minded because they definitely do a lot of these things. But I often get this impression that they have less of a natural connection to the Chinese culture, and that will definitely include the political culture, of course. And then I had this feeling that they prefer not to adjust their worldview just because they live in a different countries. They would still very much um, measure the good and the bad through their like original upbringings and values, and they would think that their values are the better values. And so energetically, Bill Bartles reads to me like the second type. And I only say that because when he talks about the Chinese people, there is a sense of detachment to his voice that I find really uncomfortable, knowing that he has lived in China for so many years, which he sometimes segued into a sharp comment about the Chinese politics. For example, he talked about the experience of sitting in a barbershop where the hairdresser asked him a rather blunt question about racism in America. And because the author is Australian, uh, he sort of segued that into a um, comment about China's obsession with America and power rivalry. And I find that to be a little wooden and didactic. I think that there should definitely be a space for that type of discussion but I expect a little bit more from a foreign journalist just because they have so much more access to the Chinese society. So I feel like it was a bit of a waste if they just focus on autocracy, repression, that kind of stuff. There should be so many interesting stories and angles to explore. For example, if you are a white foreigner in China, you already have some social privilege. And I felt like that should make an interesting story about how Chinese people and Chinese society relate to the idea of race and ethnicity and diversity. Like, talk about that. Like, why not? I would absolutely adore that level of realness. But anyhow, getting back to the book, I think Bill Bertels is a good storyteller. You can tell he is a pretty good writer. So I'm going to give it a 3.5. Next, we have Rat Roulette, an insider's story of wealth, power, corruption, and vengeance in today's China by Desmond Shun. Have you ever met someone that you know you definitely don't want to be friends with, but you are just fascinated by everything they say? <laughs> this book is that guy. The book is a very personal account of navigating wealth and power in China. It is about the intersection between business and Chinese politics, about the dirty details of power money trade inside the party, about what crony capitalism is really like. The author was born in China and then moved to Hong Kong and received his education in the United States. In the 1990s, he returned to China and made stupid amount of money through the connections to the party affiliate. And this has involved a lot of financial and time investment in nurturing relationships with the party, the princelings, and the family members of the top Chinese leaders. To me, it is also a story about human nature. China opened up its border after 1978. I think it also opened up the Pandora box that unleashed many sides of humanities that had been repressed for so many decades. The desire for power, wealth, materialism, alcohol, sex, freedom, fame, all of these went on center stage and become such heightened facets in the Chinese elite circle. The storytelling is really fluent and bold and frank. I really enjoy the experience of observing the larger society through very intimate lens of someone else. Especially when Desmond Shun talks about experience that 
normally every other Chinese people won't share. The content is very, very fascinating material. Although I think the author is being very frank, but not entirely honest. When he talks about his decision to leave China for good, he said that the reason was because China was not open and transparent enough. And I was like, come on, mate, give me a break. Like you make your wealth off China not being transparent enough. Like, don't you find that to be a little inconsistent? <laughs> the segue into democracy and freedom argument feels a bit forced to me. Although I do think that it is believable. It just doesn't feel entirely authentic. Overall, it's really fun. There's nothing like it. It's one of a kind. So I would say this is definitely a solid 3.5. It is pretty good. Next, we have The Long Game, China's Grand Strategy to Displace American Order by Rush Doshi. Now, this is definitely a case of last, but by no means least. It is a very careful study of China's strategic intention written specifically for American policymakers and political elites. So whenever we talk about the China-US relations, there is this debate about what China wants, right? Some people are very optimistic. They think that China doesn't want to dominate the world. It doesn't care as much as we think it does to displace America, to sort of outcompete it as the world's number one leader. All he wants to do is to kind of protect the system, reunify Taiwan and other territories, and then secure prosperity at home. Some people are more pessimistic. They think that China does want to dominate. It does want to be the rule maker of the new world and then export non-liberal values. So this book does fall into the second camp and it is about exploring the worst case scenario of China outcompete America in terms of economy, military capabilities and international politics. And more importantly, how China would manage to do that. I think the author really, really nailed China's worldview, especially with regards to the perceived Western decline by China after 2008 financial crisis and election of Donald Trump and the handling of the pandemic. I felt like that was really accurate and resonant. And I really love the specificities of the book. And there are so many references to the Chinese text and quotes from top Chinese leaders that I've never heard of. Rush Dashi also talks about declinism in America, which is a kind of existential anxiety happened every few decades in which the entire society would worry about America's global status before it reformed and saw another new peak. And I thought that was a very fascinating dynamic to highlight. It really helps to put things into perspective. At the end of the book, I don't think that I have changed where I stand. I still believe that China's goal is very open-ended and malleable. China is constantly experimenting with new things, new rhetorics, new language, new strategy, new policies. But this is more of my subjective cultural intuition, if anything. If you have been a China watcher for a long time and you are pretty familiar with the lingual, then I think that this book can really improve your thinking. But if you are still dipping your toes into the subject, then I wouldn't necessarily encourage you reading this book first. The writing is fairly academic. Because it is not universally readable, I'm gonna take a star away. Uh, so that's everything. Here we have two fives, one four, and four threes, and a one. I think that's not bad. I would say that's a pretty positive experience. So I definitely recommend you to check out the top. Uh, let me know what you think, your opinions, and what books you would like to read. And if you have any other book recommendations, feel free to message me and drop down a comment. All right, we have a longer one today and I hope you enjoy it. If you want to connect with me, you can follow me on my Instagram at simi underscore lan. Either way, thank you for staying, if you're still watching, and I will talk to you next time. Bye.